Hey, Southern Gothic fans. Join us online now at southerngothicmedia.com. There you can find podcast updates, links to our social media, and subscription access to our new members-only series, Southern Gothic, The Monsters. Narrated by me, Brittany Schacksnyder. Since the beginning of time, man has attempted to employ supernatural aid to help him solve worldly mysteries. From missing persons to unsolved crimes and even matters of the heart, we're continually fascinated by the possibility of reaching beyond our own reality for answers. In antiquity, those who served these roles as supernatural intermediaries were known as oracles. But as generations passed, the age-old archetypes evolved into an ever-growing number of new forms, from fortune tellers and clairvoyants to astrologers and readers of the iconic crystal ball. Yet no matter the means, these men and women who have devoted their life to prophecy and mystery can be found in every culture across the world. And the same is true here in the American South, where a man by the name of Simon Warner rose to fame with a seemingly supernatural ability to look deep into his crystal ball and solve the unsolvable. Unfortunately, tragedy befell the man from Shelbyville, Tennessee, when in a twisted tale of irony, he failed to foresee his own murder. My name is Brandon Sheck Snyder, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. December of 1940, Mrs. Lillian Ketchum, the mother of two young children, disappeared from her rural home in Chapel Hill, Tennessee, a town of about 400 just southeast of Nashville. Days passed while the town searched for the missing woman but no trace was found to spare a piece of her Sunday coat and a tragic note that she'd left for her sons Grady and David. Unfortunately, she never returned. The prime suspect in the disappearance was a man by the name of Robert Skinner. Skinner and Mrs. Ketchum had been dating for several years, but Mrs. Ketchum was already married, locked in by a husband committed to a Tennessee state facility. Locals suspected that this was the motive in her murder, a lover grown furious, frustrated, and eventually violent over a repeated denial of his marriage proposals. But Robert Skinner committed suicide only two weeks after Mrs. Ketchum's disappearance. His death stonewalled law enforcement in their search, leaving a cold trail on the whereabouts of his lover's remains, and practically confirming the suspicion of many that he had been the culprit. The resulting lack of progress and fruitless searching by the community lasted over a month before several folks from Chapel Hill finally took it upon themselves to head southwest 
to the nearby town of Shelbyville and seek assistance in finding the missing mother of two from an unusual, eccentric gentleman who claimed to have a unique gift that gave him the ability to solve these sorts of seemingly unsolvable cases. The man's name was Simon Warner. Shelbyville, Tennessee sits on the banks of the Duck River, a free-flowing waterway that spans 284 miles through Middle Tennessee. The southern town's earliest roots go all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century. Its earliest settlers were veterans of the Revolutionary War who received land grants from the new nation for their service in the struggle for independence. Then, half a century later, Shelbyville served as the stage for an important cavalry battle during the Civil War. But it wasn't till the beginning of the 20th century before economic prosperity and growth would come to the region when the town of Shelbyville became a stop on the l and Railroad line. This particular line connected Louisville, Kentucky with Birmingham, Alabama, giving the town the ability to attract factories. And as a result, Shelbyville had approximately 6,500 residents by the beginning of World War II. Simon Warner had been born here in Bedford County, Tennessee in 1897 to Daniel and Susan Warner. The eccentric but kind man would eventually own and operate a local cafe in the town where he was raised, as well as a wax museum. But in 1940, his fame grew much larger than the town itself. When the folks from nearby Chapel Hill showed up in Shelbyville searching for answers, and the tragic disappearance of Mrs. Ketchum. Warner greeted them at his home. There, he sat with them, studied the information and evidence that they had brought to him in regards to the case, and then gazed into his crystal ball through his black, thick-rimmed glasses, searching for answers. unknown exactly what he may have saw inside his crystal orb that day, but whatever information he sent these folks back to Chapel Hill with would ultimately crack the case. Not only did the information lead the town sheriff to the exact whereabouts of Mrs. Ketchum, but Warner's depiction of the scene was apparently so eerily precise that the search team recognized it instantly upon uncovering it. Poor Mrs. Ketchum's body was found frozen stiff under a pile of brush only 150 yards from the house where Robert Skinner lived, a farm in the Flat Creek section of Williamson County. Her neck was broken and there were signs of strangulation, confirming what most in the town had feared. Mrs. Lillian Ketchum had in fact been killed by her lover Robert Skinner. But through the efforts of Simon Warner, Ketchum's family would finally be able to lay her to rest with the dignity that she deserved. Thus began the real life legend of Simon Warner, the seer of Shelbyville. Simon Warner was receiving worldwide publicity, but despite newspapers' predilection to sensationalize his abilities with their bold headlines and spooky trappings, Warner preferred to refer to himself by the title of Crime Doctor. 
at the height of his popularity, he claimed he received about 500 pieces of mail a day. Letters coming in from folks all over the country, asking for help from everything from finding small objects to navigating romantic relationships. A lot of folks even showed up in Shelbyville to make their requests in person. His front yard filled up with so many cars on Sundays that spill out onto North Main Street. Warner took everyone who sought his help seriously, maintaining his professionalism despite the eccentric nature of his work. This led the crime doctor to model his home to receive guests in much the same way a medical doctor would receive patients. The front room of his home was essentially a waiting room and was decorated as such. A table with a globe on it sat in the center of the room, a half a dozen or so leather chairs scattered around for folks to sit in. On the wall was a diploma awarded to Simon for his studies in astrology, and it was framed just as any doctor's credentials might be. There were also numerous testimonial letters displayed. The letters came from all over the country, sent from law enforcement agencies praising him for his assistance. Warner's office was in the rear of the one-story home. In it were a couple of filing cabinets, two bookcases, and a small stenographer's desk that Simon used. On a table was also a recording machine that he'd used during questionings. Despite newspapers appreciating the additional spooky angles that Warner added to an already bizarre case, Simon eventually moved away from using his crystal ball, claiming that it was much more of a prop, and the skills he had are much simpler. He once told a local reporter, quote, it's a matter of concentration once I concentrate on a thing, and that in itself is the secret, I get the answers. This is the means by which Simon Warner would help people. And no matter how big or small the help, he always guarded this personal information with the same professionalism and manner as a doctor or a lawyer. Of course, law enforcement agencies continued to seek out his assistance over the years as well. And in some instance, defendants even came calling, hoping Warner could help them clear their name. As a father, Simon had always hoped to teach his sons in the ways of his profession. He claimed that he knew of his own abilities as young as 10 years old and he was pretty sure that several of his own children were already showing glimmers of the talent. In fact, Simon's half-sister, Bessie Jones, was also blessed with the ability to tell fortunes. Unfortunately, not Simon or any of the members of his family would foresee the tragedy that would soon befall him. On March 22, 1957, Simon Warner was murdered. He was 60 years old. Three hours after Warner was killed, police arrested Mose Martin, a 40-year-old man from Scottsboro, Alabama. Martin immediately admitted to the killing telling police that he'd initially sought out Warner's help to heal a stomach ailment. Martin claimed Warner accepted $60 to cure him, but the cure did not work. He then claimed to the police that Warner had double-crossed him and put a voodoo hex on him to make the ailment 
even worse. Despite the fact that Warner was not a voodoo practitioner, Mose believed the only way to end this hex was to kill the man who cursed him by shooting him through the heart. And that's what Martin Mose did. He shot Simon Warner five times with a 32 caliber pistol, killing him on the spot. Yet Mose's ailment only worsened. While Warner was alive, newspapers enjoyed his involvement in the community, running big headlines that sold papers. Headlines like, quote, Weird case develops. Crystal Gazer's eerie aid sought in baby massacres. Unfortunately, these same sensationalist reports would continue after Warner's death, tauntingly questioning how a man who claimed to see murder shaping up for weeks in advance, didn't foresee his own demise. But by all accounts, it seems Simon Warner was a good man with a big heart that truly believed he was helping his neighbors. And unlike many of the clairvoyants and psychics, only later to be debunked, Warner's abilities and successes held up under the scrutiny mid-20th century. One of Simon Warner's favorite anecdotes was about the time he asked a salesman friend for a price quote on some lumber he was selling. Joking, but also antagonizing, the friend responded, Simon, why don't you look in that crystal ball of yours and tell me what they're worth? To this, Simon confidently replied, I might look in it and tell you what they're worth, but there's no way of telling what you'll charge. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently released podcast with all content and music written and produced by Brandon Schecksneider. To keep up with future episodes, subscribe today on Apple's podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Quiz time! Who's got four legs, an opposable tail, and fans all over the world? It's Scooby-Doo, our favorite whipper. Join me and my guests on the Meddling Kids podcast for an irreverent review of Scooby-Doo. It's family-friendly. Although there is occasional talk about hot villains. Join me, Julie Kinn, every Monday on the Meddling Kids Podcast. Thank you for letting us in. We are the Haunted Heart. Two best friends joined together by a twisted fascination with magic, madness, and the macabre. Join us on our journey, where we are sometimes deep. Some... What? Did the music just cut out? Oh, sh... I can't hear it, Kenny, is it... I can't hear it either. <sighs> Did you not get a clip that was long enough for the promo? Oh, God. Oh, you know what? You know what? <laughs> We're trash talent. That's a fair point. This is a podcast for people who like trash. And... We are trash. And we like to talk about all things macabre, witchy, true crime, and anything else our little haunted hearts fancy. So join us for new episodes every Wednesday. Tune in to The Haunted Heart wherever you listen to podcasts. And, and as, as always, always, stay spooky. Welcome to Nordic True Crime.
Lucky Little Shacks.